let's look at revising the attachment topic. There's a lot to get through. I'll be as quick as I can uh, while giving you the detail you're going to need uh, for the exam. So without further ado, um, we start with caregiver infant interaction and attachment figures. Potentially a 16 market in each of these, so you're going to need to know some AO1 and some AO3 for both. Uh, for caregiver in infant interaction, what you need to know is reciprocity. This is where uh, infants and caregivers, usually the mother, uh, respond to each other's um, actions. So the, the infant might make an action and the mother responds to that. Um, and either either or the baby or the mother can can be the one that instigates that you then got interactional synchrony and this is where infants and caregivers perform actions at the same time think of your synchronized swimmers uh, Meltzer and Moore were the ones that uh, studied this and they found a correlation between facial gestures um, of the infants and the adults suggesting that uh, interactional synchrony does occur. Um, to evaluate that, a couple of evaluative points. The first one, a bit of a weakness, it's hard to know what's actually happening. Uh, are these actions intentional? Because obviously we've got infants here, they can't tell us what they're doing, what they're thinking, their interpretation of it. We're just kind of interpreting their behaviours. So it's hard to know what's going on from the, from the infant side of things. However, as a bit of a counterpoint to this and as a bit of a strength, you do have controlled observations there. So obviously these are behaviours. We can film these, we can um, show them to different psychologists, we can get into rate of reliability um, and we do tend to get that which is great. Um, also because the infants don't um, necessarily know what's going on or, or, or their behaviours then you're, they're less likely to suffer from demand characteristics. Um, but you can again another counter, another neg another negative. Well, what's the purpose of these things? Why why are they happening? Why is synchrony? Why is reciprocity? Why are those behaviours happening? What impact does it have on attachment? We we'll come to that later in the topic. Um, and there's an also uh, you could suggest here that there's a bit of social sensitivity going on with the research and impact on the economy. If we're saying that the mothers are the key caregiver, again this comes up later on in the topic, then they should be the ones that are staying at home looking after the infants. That's potentially an issue and pot potentially a socially sensitive topic and you can use that as a, a kind of weakness for these interactions because the interactions when we say caregiver tend to happen with the mother. Um, there's a bit of monotrophy, bulby, that, that comes up a bit later on. The other bit that you need to know for AO1 is about the role of the father. This could be a discrete part of the, the topic and so you need to know about it on its own. We question what is the role of the father? That's essentially the, the question we're trying to answer. What we find, and this was Shaffer and Emerson, which I'll go on to in a second, uh, the mother's usually the first attachment figure, but dad's always there, so he's usually the secondary attachment figure if he's around, 75% uh, of which the father. Um, so we question what is the role of the father. Grossman looked at this um, and found that actually the child's attachment to their mother was the key and actually the child's attachment to the father um, doesn't predict future relationships. That suggests that the role of the father is unimportant. That, again, potential issue there. We'll come on to the evaluation in a second. However, this same study, Grossman, did find that the father's play behaviour was related to the quality of attachment. So this suggests actually it's not as simple as we first said that mother's attachment is important, dad's isn't. Maybe there's a different role they're playing. Maybe it's in this play, rough and tumble play, is where the dad... Um, the father figure um, has his is in his niche and and key area. Field um, looked at this. Um, also and looked at primary caregivers which were the mothers, primary caregivers which were the fathers and secondary caregivers which were the fathers and what they found was whether it's the mother or the father it's the one that tended to spend more time uh, interacting with the infant so smiling, imitating, um, holding the infants this might link back to the uh, interactional synchrony, reciprocity, they're the ones that tended to be the primary caregiver. So actually maybe it doesn't matter whether it's the mother or the father, it's all to do with interaction. Uh, so the fathers can take up the, the key attachment figure role. Um, what do we think about this then? Um, well, Sometimes it's hard to hard to tell um, what role the father does take. Take Ainsworth's uh, strange situation. Um, that was done with infants and their mothers. So ca how can we directly compare the role of the fathers? That's different. And it does seem that there, you know, there's this societal thing in most cultures that fathers do take a 
do play a different role than the mothers. Um, and you then start asking, well, why is this? Is it a genetic thing? Is, is there some fundamental differences between males and females in, in the upbringing of children or the raising of children? Maybe. Is it societal? Is it more to do with gender roles and what's seen as, as acceptable and um, the society it was socialized what what they what they value um and again potentially um so that's a question you need to ask um McCallum and Gollenbuck looked at children raised without fathers um and found that they don't develop any differently than those raised with fathers so that again questions the role of the father so some information in there AO1 uh, and AO3 Going on then and looking at Schaffer and Emerson, uh, important researchers in attachment, and they looked at the stages of attachment. Uh, key study they had here, Schaffer and Emerson's study of 60 Glaswegian infants, all from working class families. Um, they went to to the infants, went to their mothers, asked them to keep a diary, um, looked at the, the interactions of these infants and their, their mothers. Um, they went to their home for once a month for the first 12 months and then went back again at 18 months and they were looking at different situations so what happened when the mother left when the child was left outside in their pram and they were looking for these terms again that come up later in the term i really like revising the attachment topic when you're learning it all these things are new and and different but when you're going back to revise it you see there's lots of links here so this term strange anxiety separation anxiety comes up later on in the strange situation Schaffer and Emerson were looking at that. What did they find? They found the primary attachment figure was the person who interacted with the, the child. Again, that links back to that study we just spoke about there with the role of the father. Not the one that spent the most time with it. Not the one that fed it. Again, links back to another part of the topic, Dollard and Miller. 50% um, of the infants showed separation anxiety to one caregiver, which was usually the mother. At 40 weeks, so this was later on, 80% had one specific attachment, 30% showed multiple attachments. Uh, so this suggests that maybe we do gain one key attachment and then multiple attachments follow afterwards. That was their key findings. Based on the findings from this study, they came up with stages of attachment and they think there are four. First, you've got the asocial stage, just between zero and six weeks, where the infant shows, um, doesn't discriminate between car carers and uh, non-human objects. So it's, it is a social and not necessarily showing um, socialization there. Then you've got the indiscriminate stage between two months and seven months. Um, so this is where they do discriminate between humans and objects. They do tend to prefer familiar adults, but would still not mind being passed around um, and, and can be comforted by any caregiver generally. Less separation anxiety, less stranger anxiety. It's after the seven month period when they get their specific attachment. And this is where they show preference to one primary caregiver, generally the mother. Uh, they do show stranger anxiety, separation anxiety. A month after they gain that, uh, they get they generally gain multiple attachments. So this can be, as I've already said, to the father, but it's also brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, grandparents, etc. Um, but they can get multiple attachments. We tend to use this study and link it back to lots of the other studies that, that we look at and say, well, does it support Bowlby's monotrophy? Well, in a way, because it shows that we do get one key attachment to begin with, so that supports monotropy. However, uh, at the multiple attachment stage, we get lots of attachments. That kind of goes against monotropy. So um, you need to know this study in its own right and the findings in its own right, but also it, it links back to the other studies. What What's the evaluative points then? The, the AO3, well, the positives, really good. Um, it's a longitudinal study, which is great. So it's not just this snapshot that you get from some studies where uh, you just test them once and then they're gone. We, you're coming back and, and retesting these children so you can see their development over time. And that's what allowed Schaffer and Emerson to come up with their, their stages of attachment developing over time. There's also really good external validity here. You were testing the infants in their own environment. That doesn't always happen again at Ainsworth. Um, and so it's good. It means that this is how the infants and the mothers, hopefully, but you, you could question that, um, react in a normal situation. You could suggest, however, I haven't actually got this on here, but actually, or well, maybe we haven't got good um, validity. Maybe we've got poor internal validity. The mothers were the ones that were collecting this data quite often. And so are they going to be accurate? Could there be social desirability bias in there? So that's one negative that you could use maybe a counterpoint there if you're using the double whopper um, paragraphs. 
but there's also potentially a sample bias. So these are um, children all from Glasgow, all from working um, middle class, uh, sorry, working class families. So can we generalize these results to families outside of that class, outside of that um, culture? And actually, you know, nowadays, is it the same? This was this study was um, 50 years ago. And so can can the, the are these results applicable in modern day um, parenting styles? Who knows? Um, also, this, this term multiple attachments, it's likely that these are more uh, common in collectivist cultures where many people look after the infants, whereas individualistic Western cultures, uh, that's less likely to be the case. Sorry, skipped ahead there. Now I'm getting on to it. Animal studies. So again, you need to know these in their own right, but these can link back and I'll be making the links when we start looking at the theories of attachment. You need to know about Lorenz and you need to know about Harlow. So the, Conrad Lorenz, he was an ethologist. Ethology looks at the uh, behavior of animals and tries to apply it to humans. And um, what Lorenz did, he had a clutch of eggs, um, which is just a group of eggs that were born, um, that were hatched and he hatched half of them with the mother, the, the goose. Um, <laughs> Uh, and he had the other half um, with him. Uh, he didn't sit on them, that'd be weird. Um, he just incubated them. And so um, what you had was half of these goslings, <laughs> not Ryan, uh, being born and seeing the mother for the first time and the other half seeing Conrad Lorenz. Um, and what he found was, unsurprisingly, these uh, goslings followed the first moving thing that they saw. This is a, an inbuilt evolutionary mechanism in birds and so and it's known as imprinting um, and it might give us some insight into how children uh, grow up and Bowlby used this later on he said well actually if if geese imprint um, could humans have the same thing and the big thing that he borrowed was this critical period so this imprinting had to happen at a certain time within the first few few days of them being born um, so he said well are humans the same do we have to form an attachment within a certain time period and he called that the critical period um, comrade Lorenz also noted um, what he called sexual imprinting so this is where animals display sexual behavior um, towards again so if they've imprinted printed on a human they're going to show they're going to want sexy time with a human um, obviously natural uh, and Lorenz um, noted this with a peacock and the peacock saw uh, a tortoise when it was born and the peacock then wanted to shag the tortoise um, so this suggests that this um, sexual imprinting has an effect maybe later in life and again we'll look later on at the effect of our early attachments on our later relationships and, uh, and that can potentially support it. Harlow, Harlow, Harlow was a bad man. Uh, Harlow uh, took some baby monkeys away from their mother, I think it was 16, um, when they were born, as soon as they were born, took them away from their mother and wanted to say, see, well, what effect might that have? That's one thing he was looking at, but he, he also wanted to know the effect of food and so raised these monkeys and they either had a cloth mother that provided comfort or a wire mother that just provided food um, and if you're a behaviorist you would believe that the the monkey would spend more of its time with the mother that provided food because that would have been a reinforcement that's not what Harlow found Harlow found that the monkeys actually spent more of their time with the cloth mother than the wire mother that gave the food so this kind of goes against the learning theory um, and from this they got contact comfort was an important thing something else that comes up later on Bowlby's maternal deprivation theory um, well we can look at Harlow here and this would support it so the the monkeys that were taken away from their um, monkey mothers they were then put with other monkeys and it was found that they didn't socialize very well they were rocking they held their head it's it's horrific if you see the, the images of this and um, they can't socially interact so um, it would look like they had maternal deprivation there was negative outcomes of them not being raised with their their mothers um, which was um, yeah obviously unfortunate very unethical well that leads me quite nicely onto some evaluation. So the biggest thing that you would need to say here is obviously we can't relate these findings from Lorenz and Harlow directly to humans. The, the 
uh, the thinking and the behaviour that goes behind human attachment is likely to be very, very different than the thinking and behaviour that goes behind that of geese and monkeys. And so it's very hard to extrapolate the results. That term extrapolate is a really good term to use. So extrapolate means taking from one thing and placing it on another. So taking the results of Harlow and Lorenz and placing it and saying, oh, look, this is how humans, this is the same outcome of humans, that's very unlikely. However, it might give us uh, a good indication. Uh, Gita et al. also questioned Lorenz's idea of this sexual imprinting, saying that, okay, well, if they have this type of attachment when they're young, they, they're then going to have problems in, in reproducing sexual behaviour later in life. It's obviously a really important part of evolution. You need to pass on your genes, and if, if poor attachment is going to have a negative impact on that, it's quite serious. Well, Geaton didn't find this. He they raised um, chickens and the where, where in their environment there was rubber gloves and lo and behold these chickens did at first attempt to make love to rubber gloves. Um, I probably had some friends like that when I was a teenager. Uh, but later on they developed healthier sexual relationships um, with appropriate uh, mates, both the chickens and my friends, I'm pleased to say. Um, and so this suggests that the, the impact isn't um, as deterministic as we would say, so that's quite good. The big problem here, uh, and if you look at any videos, you can Google, uh, or go on YouTube and look at Harlow monkey experiments and you'll see videos of them I'm not allowed to do I, I would put one in this video but bloody article 13 would stop me from doing that I'd get uh, banned from YouTube or something grr um, so can't do that anymore but if you search you'll find videos of, of Harlow and his monkeys um, and so yeah it's very unethical um, it's unlikely that in this modern day and age you would get away with doing that and that's an issue for reliability because we can't repeat the results. However, it, it sounds a bit heartless to say, you do need to question whether the outcomes that we found, the, the findings of the results, do they justify the findings that we found? Um, and it could potentially be argued that the, the results are so significant, well, that it was worth it. And that's, that's a bit of a counter argument. Whether you believe that or not, um, I'm not advocating it, but it's a really good counter argument if you're writing an essay on this. Next is the first of the two theories of attachment, which is the learning theory, otherwise known as the behaviourist theory. Uh, this gives you a chance to recap some of your knowledge from the uh, approaches topic, knowing what classical and operant conditioning is, but importantly in this section you apply that to attachment. So actually what students often do is talk about bulb, uh, Bulby, talk about uh, Pavlov and his dogs and things like that. Actually you, you don't get really any marks for talking about that, you need to talk about children and food and their mothers and their caregivers. So the first theory, the first part of the theory links to classical conditioning, which is learning through association, where you have a an unconditioned stimulus leading to an unconditioned response, neutral stimulus leading to no response. Those two things are paired together during learning, the neutral and the unconditioned, until you get a conditioned stimulus leading to a conditioned response. So what you need to know here is, to, beget, to begin with, the mother, day one, when baby's born, the mother, it sounds heartless, Sorry, mum, if you're listening. Uh, mother means nothing. Um, so the mother's a neutral stimulus. The baby wants food. So the food is an unconditioned stimulus and pleasure at having food is the unconditioned response. Mother is the one giving the food. So the neutral stimulus, the mother, is paired with the unconditioned stimulus, um, the food, and you get the unconditioned response, the pleasure, until eventually you realise that you're, you like being around your, your parents, your mother. And so... Uh, mother becomes the conditioned stimulus. Uh, and here you can see a diagram of that and also why I became a psychology teacher rather than an art teacher. These are my drawings. Um, but that's basically what you need to be able to describe for AO1. Then uh, the operant conditioning, that has a role to play too. Sorry, the researchers here were Dollard and Miller. Um, you can use those for both classical and operant conditioning. Uh, operant conditioning is suggesting that uh, learning through reward and punishment. Uh, and here it's positive and negative reinforcement we're talking about. So for the infant, they are positively reinforced uh, by being with the mother. So they get a reward uh, for 
being with her, which is the food. Uh, and so the, the food is the primary reinforcer. The mother becomes what's known as the secondary reinforcer. But also, importantly here, the mother gets a reward as well. She gets something that she wants taken away, taken away. So it's a... Um, a um, oh, I've lost it. A negative reinforcer, so something that gets taken away that she wants taken away, um, and so that's that's a positive there. So that could explain why we get attachments. Do we believe in this? Well, the evaluations uh, potentially, um, as I've already said, you can link back here to the animal studies that I've mentioned. Does this support it? Well, Harlow's monkeys would go against it. Um, Harlow's monkeys didn't stay with the thing that fed it. So they didn't stay with the wire mother that had the food. So that would go against the learning theory. And Lorenz's geese also didn't attach to the thing that fed them. They attached to the first moving thing that they saw, they imprinted. They had this biological mechanism. So that goes against it as well. Uh, there's also contrary evidence from humans. It's not looking good here for Donald and Miller. From human studies, Schaffer and Emerson found infants attached to the biological mother, even if they were not the ones that were feeding it. Um, and also social learning theory ignores other other important factors so it doesn't mention reciprocity interactual synchrony which we've already mentioned see here how the rest of the spec kind of links in it's really nice to, to revise um, it is thought that social learning theory might have a role to play. So this was a new theory hey and Vespo uh, suggests that actually observation might be key so Operant and classical conditioning are known as direct learning, they happen to you. However, Hay and Vespa were saying, well, maybe attachments happen through observation. You see others, you see um, your brothers or sisters hugging your parents and getting rewards. So maybe you copy that behavior. Um, and so that's a nut. It's kind of a strength of the theory because um, the uh, social learning theory derived from operant and classical conditioning. Um, it's not all bad though, so the, the, the shining light is that, well, it's likely that this does have some role to play, so operant and classical condition, but maybe it's not the only thing that determines uh, an attachment. Uh, then we get to another theory. So this is Bowlby's evolutionary theory of attachment. So it's different than what um, Dollard and Miller would have said, and it obviously says that it's from evolution so it's a biologically predetermined maybe explanation and what you need here is uh, an understanding of lots of kind of AO1 lots of terminology so I'll kind of go around that for you so the first thing you need to be aware of is this term innate and adaptive the pink um, circle there so innate and adaptive that links to evolution it suggests that the reason we have the behaviors and the thinking and everything that we have now is because it would have provided an evolutionary advantage it would have uh, allowed for survival of the fittest and passing on your genes. So what we're saying here is that an attachment does that. So if you attach, if infants that attach to their parents, they survive, they they get the food, so they, they survive and they grow up and they have offspring themselves and they then get attached. Um, they're also protected from any predators or, or dangers in the environment, so it would have been an advantage, an evolutionary advantage to, to have an attachment. That's the, the first idea of the theory here. Then we go to the light blue, social releases. So these are behaviours that elicit an, a response. So children crying, it's not nice to hear children cry. So a, a, an adult would do something about that. So it elicits a response. It is nice to hear children laugh. People like that. Um, and so you would want to make them happy. So those are what social releases are. We then got this idea of a secure base. So this is what I was saying. You're protected from the environment. It's it's good to have a secure base. So an infant would use their parent as a secure base. That comes up again when we look at Ainsworth strain situation. Then we've got the, the greeny kind of slide, monotrophy. So this is the idea that one key attachment is important above all others. And Bowlby would have said that this was the mother, that the mother is the key attachment figure and, and you need to attach to a mother um, to, to ensure survival. We then got the, the darky blue purpley one, critical period. So this borrows from what I mentioned before with Lorenz. And this says that we have to develop an attachment within a certain time period. There's a bit of debate as to what that time period is. Generally, we think it's about two years. So you need to develop an attachment with a caregiver within two years. And Bowlby would say, if you don't, you have negative outcomes. And we, we look into that in more detail when we look at uh, Bowlby's maternal deprivation hypothesis, which is a different part of the spec. And then green, we've got the internal working model. So this is the idea that our 
early attachments have an impact later in life. So we have this blueprint, this schema for what attachments are, and they are developed when we're young, uh, and that will have an impact later in life. And again, the last part of the spec is looking at the effect of childhood attachment on later relationships. So that's the kind of the AO1, the key components, the, the terminology you need to be aware of for Bowlby's theory of why we form an attachment. So it's more biological inbuilt. Um, in terms of evaluation, there is support from this. Uh, Brazelton has found that social releases are key. They ask baby, they ask caregivers, sorry, to react, to not react to their infants' um, social releases, and they found that the infants were very, very distressed and sometimes kind of curled up into a ball. It had a very negative impact. So it suggests that social releases are a really important part of development and uh, attachment. There's also support for the internal working model. Again, this comes up later on, but you've got Bailey et al. They tested mothers um, and they put they tested their baby's attachment type using the strange situation. We'll talk about that later on. But they also asked mothers what their own attachment type was like when they were younger using questionnaires. And what they found was whatever their attachment type was like when they were younger, that's how they generally parented. So if they had a secure attachment with the mother, if the mothers had a secure attachment with their mother, then they would generally parent well and their infant would also be secure. If they had avoidant, with their mother, with their own parents, then they would parent and end up being avoidant and vice versa. If they were resistant, they end up having resistant infants. So this suggests that this internal working model does kind of stay with us uh, for life. There's mixed evidence for monotrophy, again, borrowing from the rest of the spec. Schaffer and Emerson kind of suggested that it did exist. So they got this one key attachment, that's kind of like monotrophy, but also it goes against it. They, they rejected it because later on the uh, infants had multiple attachments and that would go against Bowlby's idea of monotrophy. Um, and the idea of monotrophy is also socially sensitive and I've mentioned this before but social sensitivity if we're saying that one attachment is key and that's generally the mother then if that's true if Bowlby's theory is true you'd be saying right mom, mothers can't work they have to stay at home they have to look after the kids and well what does that mean for kind of gender pay gap but what does it mean for, for women who don't want to do that and and want to go out and work, or vice versa, men that want to stay at home and be uh, house husbands and, and look after their children. It's, uh, it, it produces some issues, quite current issues actually, um, but it, it's something certainly to be aware of that you can use as an evaluation. Um, finally, and this is a, again another good evaluative point that you can use in, in several places, is actually uh, Kagan has said, well maybe it's not who feeds it, which is what Dollard and Miller would say with the learning theory of attachment. And maybe it's not just the, we've um, evolved to have a certain type of attachment. Kagan has said, well, what, what about the children? Children might be born different, individual differences. You might get a naturally fussy child or a naturally happy child or a naturally outgoing child. And he, this is known as temperament. What is the personality of the infant? What is their temperament? And actually, surely that has an impact on how the parent parents. Um, they're not just a bank slate. It would go against Dollard and Miller as well. Uh, so that's another good evaluative point. Moving on, we've got Ainsworth's strange situation. Ainsworth was actually a student of Bowie's and she developed a test for attachment and this was called the strange situation. So the strange situation was, it was a controlled observation. So there was a room set up. It was a bit like a playroom. So it could be like a nursery or a, or a room at home that the child is used to being in. But importantly, it's not actually their room at home. Arguments over whether it was seven or eight, but yet seven or eight stages to this. They were each three minutes long. Uh, child and caregiver come into the room. So come into this room that looks like a playroom. The child and caregiver are both in there and the child explores. They look at their exploratory behaviour, looking at them as a secure base. They then ask a stranger, a confederate, um, to come into the room and see what the child does um, while the caregiver is still in there. But then the caregiver leaves. The child is in the room with the stranger. Um, and look at what the child does then. Then the caregiver comes back and the stranger leaves. So the child is in the room with the caregiver again. But then the caregiver leaves, so the child is alone in the room. Then the stranger returns and sees what the child does with the stranger on their own. And then the stranger leaves and the caregiver comes back and that's the end. So they're looking at reunion behavior. So yeah, what are they looking for? They're looking for proximity seeking. What that means is how close the infant stays to the, the caregiver. They're looking for exploration behavior. Do they look around the room? They're looking for stranger anxiety. What does the child do when the stranger comes in? They're looking for separation 
separation anxiety, what happens when the caregiver leaves, and they're looking for reunion behaviour, what happens when the caregiver comes back, what they found. Generally, Ainsworth said there were three types of attachment. 66% of the time they found, that, and this was obviously the most common then, they found that the infant would explore the room when the caregiver was there, they would not like the uh, stranger, so they had high stranger anxiety, they wouldn't like it when the mother left, but they'd be easily soothed when she came back, uh, and they would be enthusiastic when the mother returned, the reunion behaviour, so that willingness to explore was high, stranger anxiety was high, separation anxiety was high, uh, and reunion behaviour was enthusiastic, so that was known as a secure attachment, or a type B attachment, is what Ainsworth called it, 66% of the time, the most common type of attachment. The next most common type was known as type A, and this was insecure avoidant, so this child would also explore the room, they wouldn't mind when the stranger came in, they wouldn't necessarily mind when the, uh, the caregiver left, the mother left, and when the mother came back again they wouldn't mind. They were quite independent on their own, so think of an avoidant baby infant as, as independent. That was known as type A and was found in about 22% of the cases. The last type that Ainsworth identified was the resistant caregiver. Uh, it's not resistant caregiver, the resistant infant. So this is one that was clingy, didn't leave the mother's side, so didn't explore the room. Strange anxiety was high, hated the stranger coming in, really distressed when the mother left. Some of the kids hit their head against the wall. And then when the mother came back, they were obviously pleased to see her, so they went to seek her, but they almost then rejected her. It was almost like they were they were still upset with her from leaving. Really, really clingy baby as a resistant type C infant. That was found in the least um, percentage, 12% of the time in, in Ainsworth's uh, strange situation. What does this tell us then? Well, well, that's a lot of good evaluation. Um, so this is um, something that my students have done. Um, so big up to uh, Evie and Mia and Anna and Callum and Barney and Aman. They wrote all this. Well done. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but you can pause the video and read it if you like. Um, but this is some good evaluation. So uh, the study had good validity uh, because it was a it was a controlled environment, but it was set up to be like a real room. So there's a bit of discussion as to whether um, the room was realistic or not. It, was designed to be and have good control, while at the same time, um, yeah, it's that balance between control and, and, and realism. Uh, the study has good inter-rater reliability, so when you show different uh, psychologist videos of the strange situation, 94% uh, agreement we generally get, so that's really, really positive. The big problem here with Ainsworth's study is probably culture. Um, so there's cultural variations in attachment, and actually Ainsworth um, is American and has potentially imposed what's known as an imposed ethic, imposed an American view of what attachment should be uh, onto attachment types. Um, and obviously that means we can't generalise the results across the world. Uh, we'll come on to that when we look at cultural variations in a second. Um, I mentioned uh, Kagan before and that, that's another evaluation here. So you're saying that there are these three different types of attachment. It was thought these were due to parenting differences, but actually could these just be natural temperament differences? Um, and the final criticism is that while not all of these infants fit neatly into one of three boxes, into type A, B or C, secure, uh, insecure avoidant or insecure resistant. It could be that in some situations they're one or another or they show bits of others. So this is known as type D or, or a disorganised uh, attachment type uh, and Ainsworth didn't account for that so that's another evaluation. The next section you need to be aware of is cultural variations in attachment and you need to be aware of the study which was Van Isendorn and Cronenberg as this is named on the spec. So Van Isendorn and Cronenberg uh, conducted a study, it was a meta-analysis actually, so looking at lots of other studies, 32 studies in eight different countries, uh, all using the strange situation. Um, and so obviously they then uh, came up with the, the levels of secure, insecure, avoidant and insecure resistant in each of those countries. Um, and these are the findings. So you need to be able to interpret this. Um, the key thing, the, the most obvious thing to me anyway, is that secure attachment is the most common type of attachment across the world. So whatever country these were done in, and they were done in Germany, Great Britain, Netherlands, Sweden, Israel, Japan, China, and the USA, it doesn't matter which country you go to, secure was the most common type of attachment. So that uh, supports Ainsworth. It suggests she had the right idea of, of what the, the majority of, of attachments are. The differences come um, in nations when you start looking at the, the makeup of the insecure avoidant and insecure resistant. 
uh, and there was a pattern. So what they tend, what they found was that the insecure avoidant infant, so the, the independent type child, was more common in Western countries. Um, and Western countries, such as Germany, Great Britain, Netherlands and Sweden, tend to be what we call individualistic. So that means the individual is seen as important, um, individual rights and liberties are, are come above uh, anything else. It's kind of the American dream type thing. Um, when you look at Eastern cultures, which they classified as Israel, Japan, China, um, the insecure resistant tended to be the more common. So this is the clingy type of baby. And these are known as collectivist cultures. Uh, and that's where groups of people and the, and the society at whole are more important than, than any individual. So it's thought that maybe parenting practices have had an impact on the attachment styles that we see. Another key finding, and we'll look at this in the evaluation, is actually the variation within cultures. So say North versus South uh, England might be more varied than between different cultures, different countries, sorry. So actually the cultural variations within countries was found to be about 150 times greater than between two different countries. So, so that's quite key as well. Um, so yeah, moving on to the evaluation. Um, so the, the positives here are that it is a meta-analysis, large sample, about 2,000 uh, 2, infants, um, and it was obviously a controlled observation, so it allowed for replicability, we could compare one study to another, so that was the, the positive of the research methods. The issue here, and this came up when looking at Ainsworth's strange situation, is what we have is an imposed ethic, so this is an American view of what attachment should be like, and we're saying, right, are these countries the same and if they're not it's almost implied that they're they're wrong uh, and everyone should be kind of following the, the American model um, so Ainsworth ideas were applied culturally incorrectly so for example in Germany there's high levels of uh, insecure avoidant and through Ainsworth's view that would be quite um, negative but actually in German cultures children are raised to be quite independent and and, and um, on their own and so the avoidant type of attachment it, unsurprisingly is more common. In Japan what we saw was more resistance so you say oh they're too clingy they're over reliant but actually again in, in the Japanese culture that's seen as a good thing uh, and this this really tight parenting where where often the infants don't leave the mother's side when they're awake um, is seen as a really good thing. So Ainsworth would classify that as resistant when actually in that culture it would be seen as a positive. Um, the thing I mentioned before about the variations within cultures, so actually comparing two countries is, is maybe inaccurate. What you should be looking at is culture and actually culture changes within countries. So yeah, 150% higher uh, within cultural variation than, than between um and obviously there, there are lots of countries and cultures that aren't um that aren't represented and i think it was either 15 or 18 of those studies were american so the american view is is overrepresented in that meta-analysis and then finally we, we've come to this again but temperament might have a role to play here what are we actually because it used the strange situation, all the evaluations of the strange situation are still relevant here. So are we actually measuring attachment or could it just be how the children were um, kind of naturally? Next is Bowlby's theory of maternal deprivation. Uh, and this follows on from Bowlby's uh, theory that we looked at, the evolutionary theory of attachment. Um, and this is saying that the negative outcome uh, in the critical period um, could have a, a lasting effect. So... To recap the critical period, Bowlby said we must form an attachment in this time. It's up to about two years, we think. Um, there are some terms you need to be aware of here. So separation is thought to be when an attachment is formed within the critical period and then lost for a short amount of time. Um, so maybe the, the mother goes away working for, for a couple of weeks. So there's an attachment there, but it, it's been broken. That's known as separation. Deprivation is meant to be when an attachment is formed, but then lost kind of in the long term or more permanently. Um, so a, a, a family break up and, and the child doesn't see one of the parents or, or one of them dies. Um, that would be seen as, as deprivation, but the attachment has, has already happened. And already as predicted by Bowlby, he would say that there'd be negative consequences if attachment is disrupted in the critical period. And um, hopefully you pick that up when we're looking at uh, Bowlby's theory. The, the outcomes that we think, um, or 
is thought to to occur due to this. Uh, lower IQ is thought to be one. So Goldfarb uh, tested this. They looked at institutionalised children um, compared to those who were fostered into families and found more emotional needs and lower levels of IQ in the institutionalised children, um, especially when they had this disruption in the uh, critical period. And also it's thought that there's poor emotional development and again there'd be an effect on attachment here. Uh, and there's this term, affectionless psychology. Um, and that's known as having a, a lack of uh, guilt, a lack of remorse, um, being quite emotionally disconnected from, from other people. Um, and it's been found that children who do have uh, issues in the critical period tend to have poorer relationships, less secure in themselves. Um, obviously, they don't have that relationship with the caregivers. They have, struggle to have relationships later in life and they tend to engage in more criminal behaviour, not looking good for them. So the key study here is Bowlby's 44 Thieves study. Easy to remember because there were 40, there was two groups, a, a control, uh, sorry, a group of 44 thieves, a control group of 44 th children, and the study happened in 1944. So lots of reasons why it's called the 44 Thieves study. Um, and Bowlby interviewed these children and what he was looking for is to see whether um, what we were just talking about did have an effect if, if a loss of attachment in the critical period had a negative effect. So he in, a negative effect. So he interviewed them. He was asking about levels of separation when they, these children were young, and also asking questions that would um, um, let him know whether they suffered from um, signs of affectionate psychopathy. What did he find? Well, 14 out of the 44 thieve group had affectionate psychopathy. Based on the interviews, they were classified as having affectionate psychopathy, this lack of guilt and remorse. And 12 of those um, children, the affectionate psychopaths, had prolonged experiences of separation in the critical period. So the maternal deprivation hypothesis, according to Bowlby, would, would be accurate. It suggests that you have the negative outcomes if you have separation in the critical period. Only five of the non Section of psychopathy thieves had uh, separation uh, and then only two of the control group had separation so it does look like if you have separation the, the outcomes are going to be uh, worse although not guaranteed because not all of them uh, fell into that group to evaluate them um, so this was supported by animal studies harlow's monkeys uh, when we looked at the animal studies um, when they were put back with uh, separated from their mothers they were put back with monkeys um, that they should socialize with they found poor later development um, and they didn't form the attachments and the, and the relationships that they should so that supports bowlby's uh, maternal deprivation hypothesis there was also another researcher levy et al um, and looked at baby rats they took them away uh, from their mothers for 24 hours just one day and actually what they found was that just that that short amount of separation in that crucial time um, these children these children <laughs> children rats baby rats uh, developed poor social development and so it does seem to have an effect on on social development but they were fine otherwise um, Rutter has suggested that actually maybe Bobby wasn't looking at separation or deprivation as he suggested there's this other term called privation um, and Separation and deprivation both require you to have an attachment and then to have lost it, either in the short-term separation or long-term deprivation. Well, Rutter was saying, well, actually, maybe these 44 thieves had privation. They didn't have an attachment at all. So actually, what Bowlby was looking at wasn't separation or deprivation like he thought, but maybe it was privation. And so it's a more serious uh, outcome. Uh, and so that's a bit of a, a question mark over over maybe some of the methods. And again, more question marks over some of the methods. Um, one, when the studies were done. So the Goldfarb study um, was 47, uh, Bowlby study was 44. There were lots happening in the world at that time. Uh, obviously, these infants were post-war. And so the effects that they've had, this affection of psychopathy, this poor intellectual and it uh, emotional development could that be a f an effect of the environment they grew up in potentially um, and also as I mentioned before Bowlby was the one that was asking um, about the, their childhood and their uh, affection of psychopathy and Bowlby knew the aims of the study should have done a double blind study but it didn't um, and so we could have an effect here that uh, there was a bit of researcher bias that went into the results we don't know
Uh, there's also contradictory evidence. So Lewis found 500 separated infants um, when they were young. 500, so a big sample size here. And actually amongst that group, there was very little criminality and actually their relationships were absolutely fine. So it doesn't seem like there is this linear, guaranteed, deterministic outcome of uh, maternal deprivation as might have first, first been thought. Uh, and then finally, um, there's a question over the critical period. Have we got examples of where children can develop well after the critical period? Well, yes. So there's a case study, uh, the Kolchakova twins. Um, they were adopted at seven years old um, after they'd been locked in a cupboard uh, at 18 months by their stepmother. Um, but they were adopted into a young, loving, caring family and they actually ended up developing well, normal IQ, um, normal relationships. So so, and that was after the critical period, obviously, it's seven years old. So actually what we're thinking is maybe the critical period isn't as critical as Bowlby might have said. Maybe it's a sensitive period where attachments are more likely to happen, but actually they can happen at, at other times as well. Okay, nearly there. Next is the Romanian orphan study. Again, mentioned on the spec, so you do need to know some research here. Uh, and the most common uh, and the most popular, well-known bit of research is Rutter's ERA study, which stands for the English and Romanian Adoptee Study. Uh, what happened here, there was a political um, movement in, in Romania, um, and basically contraception and abortion were banned. They wanted a bigger population. Uh, women were encouraged to have four or five children, and so this created a mass of children, um, but they didn't necessarily want them. So lots of these children ended up in orphanages, um, and then some of them got adopted in the UK. So Rutter studied 165 five of these children uh, who were adopted by British families and compared them to 52 um, children who were British and adopted. They This was a longitudinal study, so they tested them at four years old, six years old, 11 years old, and 15 years old, um, and they wanted to find out what outcomes they had and would it be different um, depending on when uh, they were adopted. They actually found that 50% of the Romanian orphans that arrived were very poorly cared for because the orphanages were so overrun, it was very difficult to care for all of the children that were in there, so they were undernourished, they weren't fed well enough, they were... Um, some of them were chained to the beds, the difficult ones, so they didn't get much care, uh, and they started with the delayed intellectual development. Um, and the, what they were interested in was when they were adopted. So some of them were adopted before the age of six months, some were adopted between six months and two years, and some were after two years. And as you can imagine, this again goes back to Bowlby and the critical period and, and what effect it may have. Um, so what was found? By 11, the IQ of those that are were adopted before six months, on average was 102. Uh, so that's within the average range. The average IQ should be about 100. Um, those that were adopted between six months and two years, they have a lower IQ, so they were 86. But it was worse for those adopted after two years. The IQ was 77. So this suggests that there's some sort of relationship there between when you're adopted and later development in terms of IQ. In terms of attachment, those that were adopted before six months, they were able to develop secure attachments. So they were seen as fine. However, the others, um, the most common type of attachment with the ones that were adopted between six months and two years was disinhibited, um, and again, the, those after two years, and the disinhibited attachment type, going back to um, Ainsworth's study, they're attention-seeking, clingy, indiscriminate, they have multiple carers, so it's a negative outcome. Uh, Zihan is another study that supports this. It was in Bucharest. Uh, so for all you history uh, students, rather than the geography students, that is in Romania again. So it's another Romanian uh, study. Um, 95 children aged between 12 and 31 months. Um, they were again institutionalised compared to control children who weren't in institutions and they looked at the attachment type. What they found was for the control group, 74% um, were secure. Whereas only 19% of the insecure, uh, sorry, of the institutionalized group were secure, and there was more again disorganized uh, attachment, disinhibited attachment. So this institutionalization, key word that you need to know, being in care, either in an orphanage or hospital, seems to have a negative impact. One on um, IQ and two on attachment type. What can we learn from this then? Well, 
the a strength would be the real world applications and what happens now in orphanages and nurseries um, children have key workers so what one of the problems was thought to be was that they had up to 50 carers in the orphanage so no one really was looking after them as an individual so what happens now is we get key workers we get one individual who's more uh, in charge of every child's care so you've got this holistic and it's almost meant to be like a, a caregiver um, much like they would have if, if they were being raised uh, outside of an institution so that's a positive. The issue, however, and I alluded to this when I uh, introduced the, the study, was that the Romanian orphans, it was hard to, to compare them and hard to know what was actually effective and attachment or lack thereof and what was the effect of um, the the environment they grew up in so they were malnourished they had poor care low levels of simulation maybe all of those things had the negative effect rather than the lack of attachment so it's hard to generalize the findings problem with external validity there you could claim there are ethical issues here I've seen this done incorrectly people say oh well, it's unethical to put these kids in institutions well no that was it was naturally occurring that Rutter didn't do that he was just um, uh, testing it and, and, and documenting it the ethical problems come here when we as psychologists might know you could have hypothesized that being in care um, and being adopted earlier is better for you than than not and actually if you know that and don't do anything about it um, maybe that's the ethical problem so maybe we should be maybe they should have been encouraging these children to be adopted before six months because their, their outcomes could have been better so potential ethical issue there and the other thing is that, OK, it was longitudinal up to about 15 or 16 years old. But what about afterwards? We don't know about now. So could it be that those that maybe had a lower IQ or didn't have an attachment, had a poor attachment, actually they just developed a bit later and now they've got normal levels of attachment? Could it be the other way around? Could it be the ones that were showing good signs, higher IQ and, and good attachment? Actually, they regress. They, the, the effects happen later on and, and it's hard to know. So it's not just linear saying that being in an institution definitely has a negative impact. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Last but not least then, the influence of early attachments on later relationships. Um, and much like uh, Bowlby's maternal deprivation hypothesis followed on from Bowlby's uh, evolutionary explanation of attachment, this follows on as well. So whereas the maternal deprivation hypothesis was focusing, focusing more on looking more into the critical period, this is looking more into the internal working model. So a recap of that, internal working model is a mental representation of a relationship. It's like a schema. It's like a, a blueprint for what future relationships should be like. So the idea here, looking into it in more detail, if a child has a secure internal working model, so they've had a secure relationship themselves, their expectation should be that their relationships later on should be secure and that's all manner of things their friendships their romantic relationships their if they have children their attachment with their children should be secure as well according to the internal working model and on the other hand if it's dysfunctional if it's an insecure either avoidant or resistant you would again expect that to have a negative impact on romantic relationships friendships and and later um, parenting and that's what's been tested so um, Myron Wilson and Smith looked at um, bullying and looked at, so this is kind of looking at friendships, what the attachment type you have with your parents, does that have an impact on your friendships when you get to school? Um, so Myron Wilson and Smith looked at 196 7 to 11 year olds, uh, gave them questionnaires and these questionnaires linked to one, their attachment type and two, uh, their bullying behaviour, either victims or um, perpetrators of the bullying. What they found was those in the questionnaires that suggested they were secure they had little interaction with bullying either way they were neither bullies nor the bullied um, this study actually found that those that reported as being avoidant were more likely to be the victims of bullying and those more likely to be resistant were more likely to be the bully you could potentially interpret that as saying well the resistant type they're overly clingy they maybe have a, a misunderstanding of what uh, good attachment and good healthy emotional relationships are like and friendships and so they don't maybe know what they're doing or, or they do and they're purposely manipulating it whereas the avoidant ones have maybe got no one to go to they're independent um, and so they're the bullied ones however this isn't a straightforward relationship uh, Coconis found the other way around so they found bullying involvement was predicted by being a boy high levels of externalizing symptoms and by avoidant attachment style so this is saying the other way around so the avoidant ones in this 
um, study were the bullies and the resistant ones were more likely to be the bullied. So you can interpret that as, well, maybe the independent ones were out on their own, they don't care about anyone else, whereas the resistant ones were, were overly clingy um, and needed some help and needed friends and, and so they were vulnerable. Um, so it's hard to say which what effect it has, but what both of these studies suggest they are they have mixed findings, but it's consistent in the fact that a poor attachment tends to lead to poor outcomes. That's not in dispute. So this is the the effect of later relationship in terms of friendship. In terms of later romantic relationships, the first study to look at would be McCarthy. Uh, this is where 40 people whose attachment site was studied when they were younger, they were then asked about their um, friendships and their older romantic relationships. And it was found, unsurprisingly, that those that had a secure attachment with their parents, they tended to have better friendships and reported having more healthy romantic relationships. Those that were avoidant, again, unsurprisingly, struggled with intimacy. And those that were resistant struggled to maintain future relationships they were overly clingy overbearing uh, and too much to handle for for friends and romantic partners the key study in later romantic relationships is Hazan and Shaver. Uh, big study here. So there were 620 replies to a questionnaire put in the Rocky Mountain News called the Love Quiz. And what the Love Quiz did was ask questions about um, what uh, people's attachment type was like with their parents. So it asked retrospective questions, what, what, what it was like when they were young. Then they asked about their current uh, relationships. Uh, and what they found was, well, the first finding was that of those that uh, answered the questionnaire, 56% were found to have a secure attachment when they were younger, 25% avoidant, 19% resistant. So those are roughly in line with Ainsworth, so that adds a bit of reliability there. Um, but then what does that mean about later romantic relationships? Well, those that were said they had a secure attachment when they were younger, they tended to have good, long-lasting romantic relationships. They, they reported having positive experiences um, of love. Um, the avoidant infants tended to have a fear of commitment, a fear of intimacy, jealous, they tended to have more romantic, more sexual sexual partners. Um, and so because they didn't have this intimacy, they, they were on their own, they were avoidant, more one night stands, etc, etc. Um, and then the others were the resistant, the clingy, over the top, overbearing, too much, texts all the time, um, really, really clingy, uh, really, and so they struggle to have romantic relationships. Everyone can think of a friend that is a bit like that, overly clingy, overbearing. Uh, and if you can't, it's probably you. Um, and then finally, it was looking at parenting. So what effect does uh, your attachment with your parents have later in life? Well, this is, we mentioned the Bailey study before, where mothers were asked what a questionnaire about what their childhood was like and then they were put in the strange situation and what they found is um, continuity so this is the continuity hypothesis so whatever the parents attachment type was like with their parents that's what their infants were like so a secure a mother who was secure to her mother would have a secure infant etc etc avoidant avoidant resistant resistant um, so overall the type of attachment we have when we're young has an impact on our relationships our friendships at school, our romantic relationships, and um, our parenting styles. So, what do we think of all this? Well, um, there does seem to be mixed results. There is some consistency and support for the continuity hypothesis, and we've seen that throughout. There's studies that, that support all of these things. However, it's not as um, open and closed, or black and white, as, as we might have us believe. So, uh, Zimmerman found uh, individual attachment is changeable between infanthood and adolescence. So if they were deemed as secure when they were when they were young as infants, they might have been deemed as insecure as adolescents. So it's changeable. It's not as um, deterministic as as we might um, make out. And actually, it's Clark and Clark who said, well, actually, what where we will stand, it's a probabilistic um, outcome. So what that means is um, the attachment that we have will probably have an impact later in life but it's not guaranteed there is some still some free will there it's not purely deterministic um, issues um, the biggest issue here is that lots of these studies have asked about what people's attachment type was like when they were younger but this was several 20 30 40 years um, after the event and so are we likely to to know what it's like well 
because it's retrospective, probably not. Um, we might not have a realistic view of what our attachment type was like. It might have been clouded by other things. Or it could be that people are trying to put across a better um, outlook of what their childhood was like than, than actually they had. They wouldn't want to admit it. So there's potentially social desirability there. So there, there's issues with validity of the research methods quite often. Um, and there's also the problem that actually when Bowlby spoke about the internal working model, it was meant to be an unconscious, we're not aware of it. And so by asking us questions about, well, what's your attachment type like? Well, you can't reach the unconscious. And so can we actually have um, a, a realistic view of what our internal working model is like? And breathe. So we're done. It's a big old topic. It is one of the bigger year 12 topics, um, but hopefully that gives you a, a quick overview of the attachment topic. Thanks for listening.